I assume, who encouraged you to go to Cambridge. Oh, yes. Uh, well, you were his prize pupil. Yeah, you yeah, his he, yeah, he, he, uh, he. And I should say that Lionel Trilling was the great critic of, uh, of that period, of the 1940s and 50s. Well, Lionel, uh, who became my friend uh, after he was my teacher, uh, did say uh, that I was his best student, the best student he ever had. And when I wrote about this in my book, uh, Ex Friends, I, I said that uh, when he said I was his best student, it was like um, Andre Gide, the French writer, who was asked who was the greatest French poet, and he said, Victor Hugo, alas. alas. <laughs> and I think, I think there was an alas in, in Lionel <laughs> Trilling's praise even, of me. So even then, he, there was some sense in which you weren't quite what he had in mind? For right, right, best. right. Why is that? Because of the interest in Hebrew literature? Yeah, well, partly that, but uh, I mean, uh, uh, he, um, he sensed something in me that uh, he would that he would later come to, come to disapprove. <laughs> but we were, by the way, we were for, for a very long time, almost, uh, in fact, to the day of his death, uh, very good friends. Uh -huh. and, uh, well, uh, let's talk about your friends, mm -hmm. or your ex-friends, rather. You wrote a series of books. The first book, and as I said to you before, um, it was a book I read a uh, long time ago, and that uh, struck me strongly, and that was making it, mm -hmm. about your sense that you argue that intellectuals look askance at des a desire for fame and wealth, um, and that they're perhaps hypocritical in that sense, mm -hmm. and that you were putting forward the idea that you did want those things, mm -hmm. and it wasn't antithetical to the thinking person right. to want success. Right. Um, you got a tremendous amount of flack for that book, and I think you were shocked at the time when, when that happened. It was yeah. in the 1960s. And then you wrote Breaking Ranks, which dealt with your political shift, and then Ex-Friends, which dealt specifically with your breaking with, and I'll name the people since they're so well known, Allen Ginsberg, Hannah Arendt, Lillian Hellman, Norman Mailer, and Diana and Lionel Trilling. Right. Well, you wanted to know why, how I came to break with these friends? Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in, uh, in this case, in the case of every one of these friends, uh, it was politics. Uh, that uh, that drove us apart, and uh, as I was moving rightward, um, uh, some of them were actually moving leftward. I mean, Hannah Arendt. When I first met Hannah Arendt, uh, she was far to the right of me, and by the time we became ex-friends, she was far to the left <laughs> of me. Um, but uh, they very much disapproved of. Uh, of what I was uh, up to politically, mm -hmm. and uh, we, uh, in some cases, we had fights. In other cases, we drifted apart. Uh, but could I stop in every you case, there? it was very painful. It's interesting that you say it was politics, mm -hmm. and yet the reaction to making it was not a, it was not political. No. It was more about taking a particular stance mm -hmm. that was believed to be vulgar, inappropriate for an intellectual mm -hmm. to state. Mm -hmm. Do you think that might be really at the root of it more than the political? In my case, no. No. No, because I I did not make any ex friends in the in the in the wake of making it. I was terribly disappointed and, mm. uh, and hurt uh, by the response of, of a lot of my friends to that book. Um, mm. But um, but it didn't result in any broken friendships mm -hmm. at all. No, but there was a there was a political uh, uh, how shall I say penumbra or emanation in making it. Uh, because what I was basically defending there was what, uh, what on the left was called bourgeois or middle class values. And, uh -huh. uh, and this uh, 1967 was the worst possible time for anyone to try to defend middle class or bourgeois values. Uh, it was a miracle of bad timing, that book. Uh, and th that itself had political implications because it was, again, part of uh, what I uh, keep saying, uh, part of my so to speak, rediscovery of America and what America stood for and stands for and why it is precious and uh, not only uh, needs to be defended but uh, needs also, deserves also to be celebrated. We live under a, a system that has provided more liberty and more prosperity to more of its people than any society known to history. And in fact, more of those things than even the utopian dreamers of the past ever imagined would be possible. This is an enormous achievement. 
And you see, when, when we neoconservatives began singing these hymns of praise to America, uh, we attracted an enormous amount of attention. Why? Because it was so unusual for accredited intellectuals to have a good word to say about America, especially mm -hmm. at that period. It was a man bites dog mm -hmm. uh, phenomenon. I want to talk about Commentary Magazine, mm -hmm. which you edited from 1960 to 1995, 95. so 35 years at that magazine. It started to the left. Mm -hmm. It ended up as a neoconservative mm -hmm. journal, um, magazine. Could you tell us about wh how that magazine, what kind of um, influence you feel it had under your editorship, and perhaps how it's changed since then? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult uh, for an editor, or for that matter, a writer, to gauge uh, his own influence. Uh, it's something you have to discover from the outside. I mean, I edited a commentary from month to month. I was trying to put out uh, the most interesting issue, uh, best issue uh, I could put out that month, uh, but best and interesting meaning to me, mm -hmm. uh, and in the hope that others would, would would agree with me, uh, but I, 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 that, that's, that's the way I edited the magazine. And I, I have been told, I've read, and I have reason to believe that um, the magazine did have a great deal of influence um, uh, to begin with on the left. I mean, in the, uh, uh, in the early 60s, uh, uh, commentary I published and wrote um, articles that had um, a formative influence on what was not even called a new left yet, uh, and uh, and even uh, even what came to be known as the counter counterculture. Uh, I discovered writers, or I, I unearthed writers who had been neglected. Uh, uh, Paul Goodman, for example, who was a, became a very big name in the '60s and now is forgotten. Um, there were many such people, and. Um, so uh, the, the magazine had um, uh, gave a kind of how shall I say highbrow or intellectual legitimacy to some of those currents that were coalescing into a, the political movement that got mm -hmm. to be known as the New Left. Uh, when, as I became disillusioned with that movement uh, toward the toward the end of the decade uh, and began uh, becoming its 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 most ferocious critic in the in the magazine. Uh, we had a, a great deal of influence on uh, the climate of opinion uh, in the 70s, and some people say through that influence we made it possible for a candidate with the views that Ronald Reagan carried to get elected president. Not that we elected and we didn't control mm -hmm. votes, but, but we did help to shape the climate. You have said that to be a good editor, you need great arrogance and great humility, mm -hmm. which I think is a wonderful way of putting what is involved in that process, and that you had that as well as the literary gifts. Yeah, well, it's necessary. one of the reasons that there are so few really good editors because uh, that degree of arrogance and that degree of humility r rarely go together in the same person. The arrogance is necessary <laughs> because you, you have to be able to assert that you know better than a lot of people who are writing on subjects that they know more mm -hmm. than you do about. You know better than, than they, how, how it should be expressed, shaped. Uh, the humility comes in in, 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 the, in the literal selflessness that a, a really good editor needs in order to subordinate his own talent to the talent of others, to try to make others look better and sound better than they, now, than they if, do. Now, if I might in, interrupt in, you there, I, I read poem. somewhere that Alan Ginsberg once edited <laughs> yeah, a right. poem of yours that's for right. Columbia Magazine, that's right. and that perhaps someone had postulated that was the basis he of your poem. He postulated. He postulated it. Yes. Well, he, tell us a little bit about that, and what was, what's your feeling about, I mean, I know <laughs> you wrote about him in an ex-friend. Yeah, well, when, when, I, when I was a freshman at Columbia, he was a senior, and he was the editor of the Columbia Literary Magazine, the Columbia Review. Uh, and I had written a very long poem called Jeremiah, about the prophet Jeremiah. It was very long. And I, with great trepidation, submitted it to the Columbia Review, and to my utter amazement and delight, it was accepted for publication. Uh, but it was too long, and uh, I, I was um, uh, perfectly happy uh, to allow it to be cut by Allen Ginsberg. And not only did I feel no resentment, I felt grateful. You know, okay, to be recognized. So that... Many, many years later, uh, Alan, uh, who was, uh, had a 
very weird obsession with me. He used to, he wrote about it, dreamed with, about me and argued <laughs> with me. You wrote uh, about that. Yeah, well, yeah. He, I mean, this all words came out of his mouth. This was not mm -hmm. my idea. And I didn't even know about it until later. Uh, he told an interviewer that uh, the real reason that I had moved to the right and was uh, also uh, hostile to him was that he had cut my poem back in 1946. <laughs> and oddly enough, Norman Mailer recently said the same thing to an interviewer in the Paris Review. He blames himself, he says, for my move to the right because when he wrote a, 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 an attack on making it, which he had originally told me he thought was a wonderful book, <clears throat> this uh, threw me into a depression, and uh, which, by the way, is true. I was quite depressed. And it was out of that depression that I uh, started moving I rightward. see. OK. So, well, uh, we're, we're almost out of time, but I want to ask you one more question. And that is whether you think liberals and conservatives can be friends. No. Not, 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 if, uh, not if they take their um, views seriously. Uh, they can only be friends if uh, they agree to more or less bite their tongues uh, when, uh, when, when the, the radioactive <laughs> arguments begin. Uh, so you either have to bite your tongue or you have to fight all the time. And these are both unpleasant I alternatives. See. I can't see you, Norman Poderitz, um, biting your tongue. <laughs> well, uh, no. Or rather, Norman put Horace. Yeah, Excuse right. well, me, I'm well, going back to yeah, my child. Yeah, I, I, I'm not given to biting my tongue, but on the other hand, it gets to be a, a real drag to be fighting all the time whenever you go to dinner or to parties. And so people, in, in the case of some of my ex-friends, there were no real breaks. It was just a gradual drifting apart. Mm -hmm. That's what happened with Mailer and also with Lillian Hellman. Okay. Well, thank you very much for talking with us. Thanks for it's having me. It's been illuminating. And thank you for joining us today at the Drexel interview.